Uh, good morning everyone if you are tuned in for our latest welcome to yorkshire webinar this morning on uh, yorkshire attractions uh, opening uh, over the last few weeks and days and of course as we all look forward to um, a further opening of the um, tourism industry we're just going to wait a couple of minutes i suppose maybe another 60 seconds just for make make sure people can log in and get ready but you are at the right place if uh, if <laughs> if you're supposed to be here you're very welcome and if you're not you're very welcome as well uh, about 60 seconds before we kick off so this is the welcome to yorkshire latest webinar on yorkshire attractions opening all around the county as we speak we've got some wonderful guests that we'll introduce as we start this morning's proceedings uh, we've also got emma and pete who are ably assisting us in the background there and you can join in this morning if you want via our twitter feeds so the main one is welcome uh, to yorkshire which is welcome to yorks so the number two that's our main consumer channel and our industry channel which is wty industry you can also email us info at yorkshire.com and you can actually use the info bar on the right hand side so if you want to click and write us any questions uh, throughout the afternoon or the morning even getting ahead of myself uh, you're very welcome to uh, so just a quick hello to three of our guests we're, we're really delighted on a monday morning to have such a an esteemed panel so we'll start with Cheryl Williams, Director of Yorkshire Wildlife Park. Cheryl, how are you this morning? Oh, very good, thank you. You weren't expecting me to throw to you just so early, were you? Oh, I was poised. Oh, poised, like almost like a tiger, like the tiger behind you. Just quickly before we go any further, who's that handsome young man? Oh, that's Vladimir. That's one of our ammo tigers. It's a beautiful portrait, isn't it? One of our annual pass holders painted it. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, we'll come on to Vladimir and, and all the other wonderful animals that uh, we can come and see over the next few weeks. So Cheryl, thanks for having thanks for being here this morning. Uh, next up, Abby Olive, Head of Marketing at Sales uh, and Sales at Castle Howard. Good morning, Abby. Morning, everyone. Hi. I've introduced you so many times, Abby, that I'm a bit ring rusty. It's Monday morning. You know what it's like. It's all right. I understand. <laughs> it's uh, it's a bit relentless at the minute, isn't it? This uh, the Yorkshire weather we've had to contend with over the last 24 hours. Um, but, you know, we're up and raring to go and excited about another week of being open and hopefully opening some more bits of Castle Howard. So looking forward to chatting to everyone. Yeah, it's uh, we've had uh, all four seasons in one day in West Yorkshire over the last 24 hours. But Abby, yeah, it'd be great to find out, you know, the latest developments at Castle Howard. And as you said, which parts of your wonderful castle and grounds are opening over the next few days and weeks. And finally, uh, Bernard Donoghue, Director of Association of Leading Visitor Attractions. For the purpose of this, we'll call them Alva because that's how we know, know them in the industry. And Bernard, you are the busiest man on the webinar circuit. Uh, it's true. So if we can speed this up, I'm leaving in 10 minutes. <laughs> Uh, I presume we've we've sent you the fee because at the moment you're in you're up your hot property. But thanks for having thanks for being here with us this morning. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure. No problem. So we'll uh, we'll just do a quick preamble as to where Welcome to Yorkshire are at uh, before we introduce our guests fully and they can introduce themselves and where they're at in their own in space. But as I said, if you want to join us, you're very welcome. We're on Twitter this morning. We're on Facebook. Uh, in fact, you can probably find us in any way you want, especially on the website. And we'll upload this to our industry pages later on. So info at Yorkshire.com if you want to email us. Um, welcome to Yorkshire Twitter handles, both consumer and industry. So this is the latest in our uh, webinars during the lockdown period. It's been a difficult period for all of us, but at the same time, we feel like we're almost coming out of it, don't we? We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. The, the retail industry opened uh, midway through June, and we've got the first few weeks of, of research and, 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 and intelligence on that. And of course, the 4th of July is the big day. I, I suppose that we're all marking um, as the, the kickstart, really, of the hospitality industry coming back into life. Independence Day in America, Independence Day, we're calling it over here, which is great news. But at the same time, we can probably discuss that because in terms of having you all on as experts this morning, we'll be remiss of us not to talk about that. But we're specifically speaking about our attractions opening throughout the county, which there are many, many, many. And it's so great to see, um, you know, the fact that we can walk around beautiful castles and gardens like Castle Howard or visit uh, tigers like Vladimir, etc and polar bears and all the wonderful animals that we can see over the next few weeks and months. So what are Welcome to Yorkshire doing right now to aid recovery? Well, in the last few weeks, we've launched our recovery plan, reopen, recover and rebuild. So a three stage uh, process here. We're 
acutely aware that we are not perfect. It isn't perfect, but at the same time, coronavirus isn't proving to be perfect. With the overnight news of a potential spike in Leicester, it's clear that we're going to have to take this uh, problem on day by day and roll with the punches. However, we've tried to take a proactive approach to everything that we've done since day one. We locked down relatively early and asked our staff to work from home. So um, as an agency that's principally responsible for welcoming people to the county, it's been very difficult to ask people to stay away from our castles, parks, gardens and attractions, our three national parks, uh, the Yorkshire coast. Uh, but at the same time, the re reopening phase is, is happening across the industry. And we're acutely aware that whilst um, the 4th of July is the hospitality uh, hospitality industry's first day to get back into gear. We're looking at the arts and culture sector being months and months away. So that's a real concern for us. Hence why the reopening phase is going to be staccato. It's going to happen as and when. The rebuild and the recover is going to take months. It's going to take years and it's going to be a real joined up um, effort there. Hence our hashtag, the Yorkshire Together hashtag, suggests that We've all got to play a part, public, public sector, private sector, individuals, um, attraction owners, staff, uh, welcome to Yorkshire. We've all got a part to play. We've launched our Yorkshire gift card, which can be spent at the Yorkshire Wildlife Park and Castle Howard in weeks and months uh, going forward. The aim is simple. Uh, a gift card it can be bought by anybody, for anybody, for Father's Day, just gone, Mother's Day, uh, Christmas, birthdays, etc. And the aim for Welcome to Yorkshire is to just get economic activity kicking kicking around in the in the industry itself. We've also launched um, a regular monthly digital version of This Is Wine magazine. So our wine magazine, much heralded, um, it's an annual subscription, free, but at the same time, we're now giving it away every month with content that's coming into us from all our members uh, that they can share. We've also launched a free affiliate membership so membership for Welcome to Yorkshire is a paid for service, but the affiliate membership offers you a number of things, um, monthly and weekly emails, updates, opportunities to join in these webinars and some monthly prizes coming forward. The addition is that you can join the Yorkshire gift card free of charge as well. So the Welcome Back to Yorkshire campaign, which is part of our reopen strategy, will kickstart in the next couple of weeks. And again, as we mentioned, it needs to be a very phased in approach. Uh, there's no point going, we're ready. If we're not, so we've got to be very sensitive and a touchy feely approach to this, taking into account the speed at which attractions can open, but also the speed at which um, residents of particular parts of Yorkshire want, want um, tourists back. What we don't want is any vigilante protest, but equally, we don't want to put off um, any any visitors, whether they're new, whether they're first time, whether they're returning, you know, we need the, the benefits of tourism, including the the exposure, whether that's uh, an Instagram picture, a Facebook message, a thread, but also money, of course. So we'll move on to today's webinar. We've got a Q&A panel, as I say, on the right of the screen. If any of you want to send in any questions, you can tweet them in or email them in. We've got a few that have uh, come in already, but I'm going to start by handing over to our first guest, uh, Cheryl Williams, Director of Yorkshire Wildlife Park, who I was on a webinar with just the other week um, with part of the Visit Doncaster Trade Association. And it was great, Cheryl, to hear how you would approach this. And it wasn't necessarily just bringing um, visitors back. It wasn't necessarily, you know, exposing the animals to all these wonderful um, guests that were coming back for the first time going, who are you? Who are you? Etc. But it was also about staff making them feel trusted, making them feel confident that you were a safe place to reopen uh, and welcome back visitors. And I suppose, were you able to do any research prior to opening on, on footfall and how you were going to do it? Can you introduce us to how you did it? Is it a ticketing system? Um, over to you, Cheryl, for the next 10, 15 minutes, if that's OK. Yes, thank you. Hi everyone, Cheryl Williams, Yorkshire Wildlife Park. I thought probably the easiest thing to do is chat through our reopening journey with you because I think we've learned a whole load of things on the day um, that we did it <laughs> since. Um, we're very lucky that we've been supported all the way through our industry body, which is the British and Irish Association of Zoos, who were lobbying very, very hard for the reopening of zoos. And um, we had a bit of a false start around June the 1st because we were hearing the rumour that zoos were actually going to reopen um, in the first tranche, which kind of made sense to us because the, the gardens had opened up, ticketed gardens. And when we closed, we'd been pretty much one of the last attractions um, to voluntarily close sort of in that sector there. 
So um, we got everyone back. We hyped everyone up because we believed we were going to reopen then and uh, it didn't happen. But the good thing was that that false start really made us look in, in true anger at the problems of reopening and the speed that we'd have to do it, which was good because when uh, Boris finally announced um, that zoos would be able to reopen on the 15th of June, then that was on the Wednesday and we actually reopened the following Monday. So in terms of getting all that done, it was it was very, very tight to pull everything together. So it was a good job that we'd already put quite a few things in place. I'll start by talking about the staff, which, which James just alluded to. We tried very hard throughout um, the process of, of people being furloughed to keep in touch with everybody because um, we furloughed around 70% of our staff. Obviously, we still kept um, a skeleton team on site. You obviously can't furlough animals. And um, so we had tiny team on site, animal staff, maintenance, veterinary, that kind of thing. Um, but the majority of our staff are actually customer facing. So catering, retail, visitor services, and obviously we know visitors, then there was, there was no job for the, for the short term there. So they were furloughed. We set up a, a staff Facebook page and kept in touch with them very regularly with videos of what was happening on site, showing them, you know, the animals were still being looked after and, and really tried to keep communication going with the staff team that way. Um, when we started to bring people back to reopen, our head of HR did say to us that, you know, people were going to be really quite emotional about coming back. And of course, the trouble with, with being on the marketing side, on the commercial side, you're so focused sometimes thinking about how you're going to say things to visitors. And you realise that actually the most important thing is to make sure that you're communicating as well, if not better, with your staff team, because they're the ones that are out on the ground talking to people. And we created a video showing them all of the measures we'd put in on place on park. And we actually brought staff back in for induction training before they came back on site as well. It's really important that they feel sort of safe and, and you're looking after them in their job. So we had to reassess all the job roles, um, reassess all the risk assessments, offer them PPE if they wanted it, not just if they required it for their job role. So, you know, if they want to wear a mask, that's fine. That's absolutely fine, even if it's not, not required at the moment. So that was, um, that was sort of the way we approached it with our staff. And I think on site, there were a lot of changes. Um, signage is signage will take a lot longer than you think and I would say to anyone that knows their own attraction is walk it when you do the signs and really think about how the visitors use the site because things we've learned we we have some one-way sections in the park we have some two ways on the big paths and uh, we have somewhere we're advising people to go sort of single file it fits for two ways interestingly <laughs> The paths where you think you would not have a problem are the ones we've had to review and make some of them one way. And they're actually some of the bigger ones, but they're where the key animals are. So it's really a case of walking the site and thinking, where do people naturally stop? Where do you normally get the crowds around? And, you know, if you've got polar bear diving in the water, everyone stops. And that is then, you know, one of the widest paths, everyone stops. So that's... Uh, one of the things we have learned is to just just review what's happening all the time and also what you're doing with the animals all the time we we had a bit of a log jam on one of the pathways by giraffes on the very wet day we had last week uh, because the rangers suddenly decided they were going to put a, a large browse feeding device up so the giraffes could come and eat branches whereupon everyone stopped and then that was sort of like no one could get past so yeah, you, you have to sort of really be on the ball with the operational knowledge of the site when you're doing that. Um, we also took the decision not to allow picnics on site. Um, before we opened, we had the environmental health officer around and we got a very good report. She looked at all the signage, all our plans for the takeaway services from the kiosks and everything. Um, but she told us that we couldn't use our wooden picnic benches. So as we didn't then have proper picnic facilities. There are still some benches around the park, but not full picnic facilities. So we advise people not to bring picnics. And interestingly, there's not been too many people complaining about that. 
apart from the people who didn't bring a picnic, but then saw someone that had actually brought a picnic and was picnicking. So it's that people kind of like policing themselves on that one. Um, most of the sites open. We've got large outdoor site, so wide pathways, that's all fine. Obviously our play areas are closed. We're just looking at the new guidelines came out yesterday for reopening the outdoor play areas, which hopefully won't be too onerous. Um, toilets was a big talking point uh, <laughs> between all of us within the different zoos. We've got our own uh, sort of commercial group networks, talk to all the different zoos about what we're doing. So we did compare notes quite a lot and contributed towards the BIASA guidelines for reopening of zoos. Um, our toilets are sort of permanently manned, so there's social distancing queues with markers. You've got people with sanitizer before they go in, and then they're they're sort of regularly cleaned. We've got a team going around all the time. So it's um, that was one of the main questions. One of the main questions that that visitors will ask as well. No ranger talks, obviously not allowed to have sort of anything that sort of gathers people too much. And we've had to close our animal walkthroughs um, at the moment, though people can still see those animals from the outside. So we've had impacts on site, but it's not, um, it's still a good experience for people and we've had good feedback. Everything's a lot more staff intensive than we thought. You need a lot more staff out in places. For example, we've got four people in the car park all day because um, we've now got advanced tickets only and uh, time slots, three different time slots in the day, which spreads people out. But then that also means that uh, the arrivals are spread out and because of the social distancing parking, they have to be managed a lot more. So again, that's more people. You need more people out on site. We've got uh, rangers going around with high visits on with a social distancing message on the back. So there's quite a lot of um, a lot of things to do where, where people just need need to see you to get that kind of um, confidence that, that you're mindful of everything as well. The website was uh, mission critical when we actually sort of relaunched our ticketing. We had uh, very carefully thought about it. We knew there was going to be huge traffic coming through it. So we'd spoken to our providers. We'd got um, the load was spread over different servers. We were poised. However, our ticketing provider went down because of the volume of tickets that came in. Now, they also do Silverstone's ticketing for the F1. And um, yeah, they weren't prepared for the amount of demand we got. And that has been pretty consistent across all of the different zoos that have opened up. So any attractions watching, I really wouldn't worry about people coming back. A, a lot of the consumer sentiment research shows that people are nervous and they don't want to book for six months. But oh, tell me, our, our ticketing took such a hammering then and um, we're continuing to sell out at the moment on slots. It's um, obviously a reduced capacity and that's another thing. I mean, as well as your signage and knowing your site, capacity is also interesting because um, the, the numbers are different when you've changed your site. I and mean, we've, we've got uh, a capacity allowed at the moment, which is we set ourselves which is about a third of what we would normally do. Um, if we used some of the other calculations that are out and about, the IAPA one, um, there's one in the BIASA guidelines for calculating per meter squared of visitor, then we could actually have an awful lot more visitors um, based on what they're saying. However, we, we've kind of set it where we are because that's fine having a calculation that would evenly spread visitors all over your site beautifully. However, they don't evenly spread themselves out on your site beautifully. They too tend to go around um, the sort of the key things. So you really need to start capacities slightly low and then build them up and just see how it works. With the timed entries, it's great because they're, they're being spread out through the day, but people will arrive at the top end of their slot. So you can arrive between nine and 10 o'clock with us, but inevitably most of them will try and get there at nine. We calculated originally people would spend about three hours on site because obviously a lot of the things were closed, um, but you've got the walk around we thought three hours, probably walk around a couple of times. Uh, people are actually now staying four hours, um, which is good that they're, they're actually doing that. But we're, we're tweaking the time slots now to um, allow for that. So we never have more than 2000 people on the site at a particular time, which is uh, a, a low number for Yorkshire Wildlife Park. 
The other thing I think we learned was that it's great having everyone booking online. It gives you great communication with all of your guests, um, your ability to build your database, to talk to them, to give them all the information they need before they come, get them downloading the app because you're not giving out maps. Um, but what it does is massively increase the load on your visitor services, call centre, marketing team because of that sheer volume of all the all the work you're doing. So, so I think we, we've learned a lot of things as we've gone through. Uh, the biggest complaint we get is um, social distancing. And it, it's not that we're not doing what we can about it. It's people complaining about other visitors that do not mind social distancing. We've actually had more of an issue with this since they announced the, the, the move down to one metre because people seem some, well, there's two camps. People have either abandoned social distancing completely and don't care, or they're very vigilante about two metres and very upset about people that aren't keeping it. So that is um, one of the things that we found at the moment. And literally by the lunchtime that Boris announced the one metre, then um, we we're getting staff were asking people to social distance and we're getting uh, answers back. So sort of, oh, it's, it's going down to one metre, you know. So that, that is difficult um, at the moment. We'll see how that goes. Hopefully it will help. We're looking forward to opening the restaurants. Um, again, another challenge. So, so yeah, I think that's some of the things that we have learned throughout the whole thing. Um, we lost a lot of money during uh, the actual period that we've been closed. Obviously, everyone will know from the tourist point, you've missed Easter, you've missed May Day, Spring Bank holiday, and some brilliant weather. Who knew it was going to be so nice? Um, and so we've probably lost, we would have budgeted around five million pounds turnover in, in this sort of period, which is a huge amount, which we won't make up this year for sure. But the good news is that um, at the moment with the, the ticketing that we've got, because uh, obviously this time last year, it would have been term time, not so many people. Uh, you've got your school groups, which are lower per capita. We've actually, um, we're actually getting a higher revenue at the moment during the week than we did this time last year. However, and hopefully it's evened out because that will now continue through what would have been term time and um, will take us towards the, the summer holiday period. However, <laughs> that, that amount of revenue is not really going to increase an awful lot when we get into August. And that is when we would have really made the money. I mean, our business is feast and famine. Uh, it's famine in the winter. It was famine in the early part of the year because the weather was so atrocious. And then we had lockdown. Um, we need to sort of make hay while the sun shines because a lot of attractions and a lot of zoos are going to face big problems when we get to winter and um, they've got all the costs. They haven't made the money during the year. So I think whilst it's great we're open again, I think the, the biggest challenges are, are still to come at the back end of the year. But um, good things that have come out of it. It's lovely getting advanced ticket bookings because people, um, they they don't mind the weather then. You get them coming in the bad weather. They're not sort of whimsically making choice on the day. So that's good. Um, and it helps the database as well. Customer communications are better. Using contactless on site is much, much easier for everybody. And that's going down well. It'd be interesting to see how these habits stick um, once it's kind of like gets back to normal, because some of these things are really, really positive and helping us. And one of the big things it's done is actually taught us to be really agile in terms of our management um, throughout this and adaptable still because everything keeps changing a bit. So as soon as you think you've just got on top of it, something else changes and then it's all up for grabs again. So I think it is really a watching brief and uh, I wish everyone who's looking to open on the 4th the very, very best. It's it's hard work, but you'll be so relieved when they come back through. Thank you, Cheryl. On that point, we've got a couple of questions that are coming in and some were sent prior to this, but thank you for that. A couple of questions that we've, I suppose, scripted ourselves. Um, you've just mentioned there, good luck to everyone on the 4th of July. Is there a gem that you can offer anyone that you wish someone had given you prior to opening? Something you thought, oh, that would have been really useful um, that you can probably share with everyone? There may be more than one. <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't know. I think... Um... I think the biggest surprise is always that people never do quite yet what you expect they're going to do. 
<laughs> yes. Sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad and sometimes it's, oh, okay, <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. So yeah. I think unpredictability is the thing that you almost wish you'd have known, but you can't you can't tell anyone, it won't help them to see it on the day. Ex expect the unexpected. <laughs> expect the unexpected and and don't don't get too stuck on a finite plan because yeah. it it will change. It yeah. will absolutely change. The other thing we have done um staff wise is set up a health and safety forum meets every week. So you've got independent staff representatives and they bring forward any concerns um, from the staff side about what they're seeing, um, any yeah. concerns from visitor perspective they've picked up. Um, so that that's really important that they also have that almost independent type route to bring yeah. questions forward. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's really sensible, Cheryl, and just um, just trying to put our own recovery plan together. And I suppose I sympathise with Visit Britain with their you know good to go scheme. It's like it's like trying to put chaos theory in a box. You know, it doesn't. Coronavirus doesn't want to be solved, does it? That's its whole purpose. Um, um, so well done. Uh, you know, as you say, it's not easy um, opening with all the unpredictability. Um, just 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 a couple of other questions. What has it been like for the animals to some extent? You know, from having two months of, of them thinking, "Where's everyone gone? Am I not doing a good enough job?" Jumping into a jumping into the pool, as you mentioned with Rasputin, the polar bear. There, you know, the interaction with seeing humans again. Are they playing up to the crowd? They. Yeah, it was really funny when we were closed. The animals took great notice of you when you walked round. Um, it was it was quite nice in a way for me. I'm terrible for the business, but I could I could walk out with the dogs and and go around the park during the day. And the animals were very reactive, um, but largely because because it was it was pretty much just the rangers there. When they saw someone coming, it was generally something good was going to happen or they're going to get yeah. fed. So they're they're very perky. Um, I think. Some of the animals do miss people. Some of them yeah, yeah. like to see people. Um, others really don't bother. The lions sleep about 90% of their day, so I'm not even sure they noticed. Um, but yeah, they, they were fine. We also had some animals that actually had not seen visitors before when we opened up after lockdown. So we had two baby camels born. And then we wow. also opened up a, a new reserve with hyena and uh, gelada monkeys in. And again, they've not seen any visitors since we opened. So I think they were quite surprised to start with as well. They'd had a nice little time there, all nice and quiet. But yeah, it's uh, it's been great anyhow. OK, and lastly, before we pass over to Abby, um, you mentioned the social distancing changes uh, in the last couple of weeks. Have you been policing the social distancing or have you left it to other people? We, we put out a thread the other week on, on Welcome to Yorkshire with regards to you know, I suppose for the hospitality industry in particular, if you've got pubs and restaurants, you know, at what point do we as, you know, British people at some point go, excuse me, you're 90 centimetres away or not. Are you going to be policing that? Have you been policing it or are you leaving it to, I suppose, your staff and people to use their own judgment and sensible nature? I think it's a mix of the two. We've got lots of signage around about keeping yeah. social distance um, and we do have staff in places, certainly where there's intersection of pathways where you get people sort of trying to go in different directions um, and out in the key areas like polar walkway and everything. And I think if they. They do try and police it to an extent, but I think large our visitors have realised that it's the responsibility of individuals, you know, when they're out in the parks and on Bournemouth Beach, you know, they've got to sort of make their own decision about how far away yeah. they are. And if they've got enough space to be far enough away from someone, it's it's not as if people aren't used to it now. But we do we do try and do what we do to keep everyone comfy. Uh, some people have just got um, are just more sort of risk averse than others. It's it is difficult. OK, well, Cheryl, thank you for opening up today's webinar. Just a reminder, you can join in this afternoon. I keep saying this afternoon. You can join in this afternoon. You'll have to watch it uh, after, after we've uploaded it to the website this morning um, at Welcome to Yorkshire. Jump on the website now and you can uh, join in with a link. Uh, share it, please. And we're also on Twitter. We've got um, Emma answering tweets and we've got Pete in the background. It's at WTY Industry or I'm sure you'll find us 
at Welcome to Yorks. So we'll move swiftly on to Abby Olive, Head of Marketing and Sales at Castle Howard, uh, one of our fantastic um, open spaces, castles and gardens in North Yorkshire. And Abby, you've been open for a couple of weeks, although not everything's been open. Do you want to update us as to where you are this morning, please? Yes, thanks again for uh, having me on this chat this morning. So I think in my 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about tickets, toilets and a jolly butcher, which does sound like an Alan Olberg children's book. Um, but just first, I'm going to recap about you know what's happened in a very short time. Uh, space of time really in the last 14 weeks so just as a reminder I'm sure most of you will be aware of Castle Howard but we're a rural working estate um, we're also a lived-in family home and of course a visitor attraction uh, last year we had our record-breaking year so broke all footfall records had a series of really high profile events um, so coming out of Castle Howard's most successful year this year is of course going to look very different but we didn't entirely close down so elements of the business have continued to operate throughout the last 14 weeks so forestry buildings maintenance caretakers security um, the farm shop remained open providing a really crucial food service for our rural villagers um, and we very quickly went online with a click and collect and delivery service for food in the farm shop and the garden centre stock. Um, so, you know, I think it's just worth remembering that some of our teams um, and many of our people have been working tirelessly throughout that period and actually trying now to get them to take a bit of a break and some holiday is becoming, you know, very important. Uh, but obviously the visitor attraction side closed on what would have been our opening day of this season in March and we did furlough just over 60% of our employees. Um, many more accepted part-time hours, different work patterns, reduced pay and working from home arrangements and we cancelled pretty much all of the events um, until September. So because the large you know, a large part of the attraction though is outdoors and our gardens. We were then one of the first places to be allowed to reopen um, following the very swift announcement the government made that ticketed gardens could reopen from the end of May. And that's, I think, one of the many fantastic um, things that Bernard and Alva have been lobbying for and have you know got decisions made on along with the opening of, of zoos. But it, it didn't allow as much time then to sort of spring back into action. So we decided to open on the 3rd of June. Um, we did a members, op uh, members only opening period for the first five days. We were allowed to do that because we're not a charity um, and we don't gift aid tickets. So we'd placed a real importance on our membership throughout lockdown and the communication with those, you know, most local loyal customers. Um, so we did a five day opening for members and that really allowed us to test our new procedures from booking to um, how people enter the site um, and get some really good feedback which then helped us <coughs> before we opened to the general public um, five days later. So this is the start I think of our fourth week we've been open just over three weeks um, and along with the two with the gardens we opened two takeaway coffee shops and of course the toilets. Um, so what have we learnt at Castle Howard that maybe may help others watching and and some you know of our own top tips so starting with ticketing um you know i'll echo quite a lot of what cheryl said actually but online booking for everyone including members was quite a shift in behavior for castle howard's visitors um on average 20 percent of people booked online previous to this year um and it was always a bit of a frustration for me that we didn't capture much data and we didn't do much with that data so uh, like cheryl said i'm delighted now to have um so much data coming in and we've been we started from day one with our own designed post visit survey, which has really allowed us to make adjustments very quickly you know, on a daily basis, following real feedback from real people who've been and experienced the attraction. We limited capacity. That was mostly about flow through the courtyard and the bottlenecks upon entering the site um, to ensure that people did feel like there was enough space and our teams could manage any build up of, of footfall. The, the booking system's certainly not perfect and actually it was one that we were halfway through trying to replace, um, but it's just about working and 
and as I said, it's it's allowing us to um, manage people entering onto site. So we're working at about probably 50% capacity of what would be a busy day, but it's also coincided with some of the worst weather I think Yorkshire's had <laughs> over the last few years. So that again has, has meant we are very weather dependent, obviously as an outdoor attraction. We've tried to front load a lot of the health and safety information. So on our website, um, which actually I think 99% of people on our post visit survey said they had looked at the website before visiting and 97.6% said they found everything they needed. So all of the, you know, we've uploaded our risk assessments, our code of conduct. We had to go with our own copy and our own statements of intent because the good to go kite mark was still being worked on. And obviously we've now filled in that application and hopefully that will be another stamp of reassurance and approval. Um, but I think by front loading a lot of that messaging, it meant that when visitors were at the attraction, the rules aren't being kind of too heavily enforced. And, you know, we're not a supermarket. People generally are coming to Castle Howard because they want a sense of space, of escapism. They want to relax. They want to connect with nature and, you know, the um, the great outdoors. So we didn't want uh, once you're inside the attraction for it to be too sanitised. Um, and we've tried to communicate our rules, I suppose, in a in a very human and a very Castle Howard way. So an example being um, I, I went round the house, which is closed, measuring some of our sculptures. We've got some amazing Roman sculptures and we've got this big naked gladiator. He's great. He's gorgeous. And he was exactly two metres long. So I got a cardboard cutout produced of, of him and sort of said, this is how how far we advise you to stay away from each other in the grounds. And, you know, he'll be good for a, another week until the 4th of July when the, the obviously the metre rule um, changes. But we tried to... Um, not lose a sense of, of who you are just because you now have to impart a lot of rules. Um, so members were, as I said, the first to return. We've placed a big focus um, on the retention and relationship with members and also sales of memberships. Um, on, from our post visit survey now at the end of about two and a half weeks of surveying, about 53% of visitors are members. And actually, interestingly, of the 47% of non-members paying public coming through, 20% have said they're brand new visitors. And it really feels like we're getting um, engaging with a lot of local people who are wanting to experience what's on their doorstep um, and, you know, sort of play it safe before they go too much further afield. So that's the kind of pre-arrival stuff. Upon arrival, um, so we've, we went for blue signage, so we didn't want it to look too kind of warning and alarmist. So it's quite it's quite gentle. We went with a repeated slogan, which is um, respect the guidelines, protect yourself and enjoy your visit, which was borrowed from something Bernard said on a, a webinar many weeks ago. So thank you, Bernard. You can take full credit for that. But I think the enjoy your visit bits, the, the really important one um, and and then we've you know we felt like the welcome actually was really important because we were one of the first places to reopen we've had an awful lot of people coming through the doors saying it's the first time they've been out um and this might change i suppose for attractions who are opening a bit further along the journey but for us you know we've had people very emotional about being out very nervous about being out right through the spectrums people being almost oblivious to the fact there's been a global pandemic on. So I think we've had to, you know, welcome people in a very individual way. Um, we created what I've been calling the Lollipop Guild, which I, I realise is a very niche Wizard of Oz reference, but it's a welcome team of our employees holding, physically holding lollipop signs, asking people to respect social distancing, and they are our welcome hosts. Um, and I suppose it was a chance as well for us to make a few changes and this is where our jolly butcher comes in. So we brought people back to the business based almost as much on attitude as what their job role was. So we had, we've got three trained butchers um, in the farm shop, but because our cafes and restaurants are closed, we don't need all of those butchers within the team. So they were furloughed. But one is just a really, really personable, extremely jolly 
chap and customers and visitors love him so he was a really great example of someone we brought back and said would you be part of our welcome host team and so we've got our jolly butcher um on the the front gates welcoming people managing queues advising people where to go for the toilets having a general chat he's quite outspoken he's quite opinionated but he has a really genuine connection with people um, and we're not kind of trying too hard to censor or monitor what he's saying he's giving his experience of what the last 14 weeks have been like and we are getting so many comments positive comments about the welcome um, and and our jolly butcher so I think it's it was an indication for us that staff right now are very willing actually to be adaptable to be flexible and i think now's the time to be brave and make some changes um so yeah we we as well as doing the kind of bringing people back based on attitude again you know really personable jolly person who's normally um in one team volunteered and said i'm happy to come back and be part of the toilet cleaning team and he's going around as a janitor but we know he's he's personable and engaging with people and chatting to people as he's doing that really important visible job of cleaning the toilets so we've we've taken the opportunity to upskill and cross skill some of our teams and try and further break down um, silos and it doesn't work across the board obviously if you know if you're trained in something very specialist about heritage and building services and maintenance it's it's hard to sort of you know ask somebody else to do that job but where possible across the front facing teams we've found um people to be very willing at this point in time to do what is needed um but I think I would say as well, whilst we're doing that, it's really important not to forget about the furloughed staff and the people who haven't been on that journey with us so far. So there's quite a lot of people who still are at home you know, feeling quite isolated and quite disconnected from this big journey. You know, such a lot's happened in 14 weeks. And if you've been one of the people um, on furlough leave, you haven't been part of that yet. So as we've been bringing people back, we've been doing it very gently. We've been having a, you know, carving out time to have a cup of tea, have a chat. It's almost like a rehabilitation for those people back into um, being somewhere with lots of other team members and everybody's at a slightly different stage of that journey. So I think now absolutely is the time to be sensitive, to be compassionate, to be kind and just to take the time over a cup of tea. And we've involved cake always, of course, um, in bringing those people back into the business. Um, and then you know we've also sort of some really little tips thought about who's answering the phone make sure you check the pre-recorded messages and the out of offices that people have had on um, and if anybody's not coming back into the business for whatever reason you know just making sure we've done that admin so our messaging and communications is is consistent and then toilets of course toilets uh, are the area of most contention it's the most uh, questions we get asked um regularly you know we I, I kind of am really sick of talking about toilets actually but it is really important so in our post visit survey 65 percent of people have used a toilet 93 percent were happy with the facility so i'm hoping that we've got most of it right although it's something we continue to adapt and change on an almost daily basis so our historic building um you know castle howard's been there since 1699 it started being built and the toilets are down very uh, dark underground corridors mostly so very difficult to see how many people are in there very difficult to social distance very difficult to manage and clean so we took the decision to hire in portable toilets for the outdoors so people can queue outside hand sanitize um, and and most people have been happy with that we'd have kept a accessible toilet and baby change unit open within the courtyard building and actually we've now taken the decision to have one of our lollipop guilds managing that queue and being there to assist with that because that was causing a lot of problems um we're a great area for cycling people were you know coming enjoying the fact we had a takeaway coffee shop not coming through to the visitor attraction obviously wanting to go to the toilet having a row with somebody who's you know needs the accessible toilet and we don't we don't want to be turning people away and saying no you, you absolutely can't use the toilet but likewise we'd kind of ring fence that particular unit for people with additional needs so um we've we have taken the decision to staff it which sounds crazy and i you know i do sometimes 
check in with myself that yes the senior management team have just had a 45 minute discussion with Mr and Mrs Howard about a toilet and this time last year we just had toilets and they worked and people went to the toilet and it was no problem but it's kind of just um, making sure we get it right because I think we're all at risk of not wanting any negative social media, negative word of mouth, we're attracting a really local audience, we don't, the last thing we want is somebody leaving Castle Howard, even if they've just been a cyclist through the local area, saying, oh, we had a really bad experience. And so, so yeah, we've, we've, we're managing toilets on a daily basis, obviously upping the cleaning, providing our staff with all the PPE and, and products needed. Um, and Cheryl mentioned health and safety. That's another thing that we're regularly meeting about. So I think it's worth thinking, who are your health and safety trained people? Who are your first aiders? Are they all on furlough? Um, and you know, do you have enough people who have the right skills and qualifications on site if you're opening back up to, to make sure you're compliant and trained in, in some of the policies? We've shifted teams around and we've kind of used it as an opportunity. Um, I mentioned membership and that this is another example of of how people have been willing to adapt. We had um, we've got a fantastic person who manages our membership. Um, they weren't based physically up at the point where customers come in by re um, housing that person and then upskilling the whole admissions team on how to deal with membership queries, how to upsell and sell memberships. It's probably something most organisations have been have been doing, but the way in which we were physically orientated was just how it had always been done. Um, so we rather than trying to fit square pegs into round holes, decided we needed to find the round new round pegs to fit into the new round holes. And we've seen them um, not only have we retained members, we've seen an uplift of, of 2% of um, our membership, which is, it sounds small, but actually to grow the membership by 2% and within the first two weeks of opening, sign up 300 new members by physically just moving around who was sitting where and who had those skills has um, really benefited the organisation. And then, and then quickly, I think it's worth just saying we've continued with some of the digital content that we'd uh, you know, again, again, teams have been really willing, really agile. Our curator um, who's been at Castle Howard longer than I've been alive and is like an absolute fountain of all knowledge uh, has turned to Zoom lectures at the drop of a hat and is doing these weekly live lectures um, and we will continue to do that. And we're looking at whether there's potential to actually create a digital kind of membership using some of the the knowledge and content that we still can share digitally. Um, spend per heads down as you'd expect. So 32% of people over the last few weeks have brought their own food, but we're selling quite low spend items like coffees and cakes at the moment from our takeaway um, offers. But actually having coffee and cake is going down extremely well. And we've had lots of people saying it's the first proper coffee I've had for 14 weeks and they're delighted about it. Um, we've had about 20% no show rate on the bad weather day so whilst we're asking people to book online members you know aren't paying and committing because they can come anytime so most of that no show is about weather and actually our systems haven't been great for what if you you decide you don't want to come and how do you cancel your booking so um it's, it's about the volume of, of calls you then get and the people power it takes to to cancel off booking so that's something we're working on and Next up is, as Cheryl mentioned, Adventure Playgrounds. Um, that's that's kind of proved on our survey as well to be very important as something people want back open, uh, way over and above wanting the indoor house tour back open so far. So that's where our focus is for the next week and getting the systems in place. And, and again, I'm really, really keen to integrate any rules or any capacity management or any additional cleaning or hand washing we have to do, absolutely embed it within the narrative of it's a adventure playground and who are going to be the people who welcome children and families back or do capacity management down at, at the playground. And then my final thing I was going to end on is uh, I was this I was reading a completely a different, um, it was a play I was reading actually, there was a bit a bit in it about uh, Kintsugi which is the the way you know, Japanese pots and pottery are repaired using gold to kind of fill in the cracks. And actually they 
almost become more beautiful as an object after they've been repaired. And I was thinking about our rebuilding and repairing of all of our businesses. And it's absolutely so much harder to reopen than it is to close down. And actually, whilst you're reopening and recovering and rebuilding and repairing, you're exposed and under scrutiny. And I think we what I've tried to keep in mind is making, you know, that rebuilding and repairing process like the you know the gold bits that almost make it better really integral to the whole piece and you know if we can actually improve the original in some ways during this process um whilst we're under the scrutiny and watchful eye of of our visitors then hopefully we'll be all the better for it what a lovely well, way to end your to segment your seg Abby. And what, what's, 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 what is it? What's the, Jap the Japanese word again? I think it's pronounced kintsugi, kintsugi. So if you look it up, it's a um, beautiful way of repairing pottery. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, I think we can all understand that. It has given us all the chance to recalibrate as individuals, you know, whether it's at home with your partner or your friends or your, your children, your, your, your parents, your work colleagues, you know, and in a crisis, you do have, you know, opportunities, as you mentioned. Of course, the challenges are there in front of you and you go, how are we going to get through this? But with some reflection and with some teamwork, you know, you go, hold on, do you know what? We've not been able to stop. I imagine Cheryl and Abby and certainly Bernard and, and myself and Emma and Pete on this call and anyone watching would, you'd never, we would never have chosen COVID-19. You know, th there are so many, you know, terrible downsides that we're of human loss, the loss of business, etc. But in amongst it, there are opportunities here to, as you say, do it differently. And I think something you mentioned with the Jolly Butcher and the Lollipop Brigade, was it Lollipop Brigade you were, referred to? They're, they're and I know exactly, the Lollipop Girls. <laughs> I know exactly where you mean, yeah. It's when Dorothy is in, in Munchkin land, isn't it? And she's greeted by all these wonderful uh, sort of um, games makers almost, if you think back to the Olympic Games. But attitude's so important. Attitude of the customer, you know, coming back to to an organization that they're familiar with but it might be different and they might have to be more patient more tolerant more understanding um more tolerant of other people you know we, we are we have probably been selfish in the past um and i suppose the the adaptability of staff yes as you say is key same at any organization we're not impervious to that at welcome to york we've got to look at how we can bring people back in but of course our members are desperate for us to hit the ground running and you know we've got to get back into this at a certain pace uh, just a quick question that I asked uh, Cheryl so, Abby, so I've got to ask it yourself. You know, going back three months, what 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 piece of advice would an Abby three months on now have given an Abby three months ago about what was going to happen and how to approach the whole uh, COVID nineteen scenario? I mean, I do. I, I think probably you know I've covered it really. I tried to sort of think about that before I started talking. You know, I think it's. To check. Um, are we back? Sorry, it does happen occasionally. I'm in You're a mill. I'm in an 18th century mill, and sometimes the you know the <laughs> the, the Wi-Fi just stops. But I don't. I think we just all have to give each other and ourselves a break as well, because um, I sort of mean you know metaphorically and <laughs> and physically, it's not normal to be asked to lead a business to kind of um, troubleshoot, to find the best way of doing things. And for a lot of people, myself included, homeschool as well at the same time. And, you know, I think um, I'm incredibly positive. I can see how the tourism sector and attractions like Castle Howard and um, like the Yorkshire Wildlife Park and other people who will be on this call add so much to the well-being and the you know to our area here in Yorkshire and it's absolutely vital that we keep fighting and keep positive and keep believing that those things ought to be there for for society and you, you have days of course where you think blimey this is just hard it's just really hard and you know this is this what we signed up for um but actually you see a one visitor who you've spoken to on the phone come through the gates of castle howard in tears because they're so happy to be back in a beautiful space and it's you know i think it's we're doing what we do because we love it and because we care and because we're passionate about it and because ultimately we believe it enhances you know the place we live and the people um we live among so i think it's just trying every day to get up and um remember why we're why we're doing it 
Spot on, Abby. And that's a perfect segue to, to, to move on to Bernard now because uh, Alva's members include the UK's most popular, iconic and important museums across the country. Galleries, palaces, castles, cathedrals, zoos, historic houses, heritage sites, gardens, leisure attractions. And Bernard, you have vast experience in the industry. And as I mentioned at the start, tongue in cheek, that you've been ever so popular over the last three months because you've been that shining light for whether it's Abby, you know, whether it's Cheryl, whether it's me to watch vicariously, to really, I suppose, stand up for all these organisations. And I suppose, to some extent, lobby, but also prepare the public that, you know, if we don't fight for the existence and if we don't look at funding methods, they will be gone and they'll be gone forever. So as Abby just mentioned there, you know, it, it's been really difficult. It's been extremely difficult for, for Welcome to Yorkshire. And I've only been here six months. I'm thinking, wow, I can't wait to see someone who's going to say something positive or nice at some point. They're probably out there. So Bernard, how's it been for you as an organisation over the last few months? And how have you approached it? Well, <clears throat> thanks very much for the in invitation. First of all, it's, it's, it's really lovely to, to be with you. <clears throat> and I have to say, I mean, all I'm going to do really is to echo the points that we've already heard because they're, they're exactly UK wide. Um, but before I do, uh, I just want to tell you a little story, which is um, when we moved into our new house about three years ago, um, we only had one breakage, uh, and which isn't bad going really. Um, and the breakage was a really special um, piece of, of ceramics that a friend of mine had made and it broke, but I managed to um, repair it with Kintsugi. So um, a <laughs> sheer coincidence. I actually, as, as Abby was telling the story, I just nipped out and got it and brought it back in. But um, yeah, so this is, a, this is a working example. I did this. Um, and there is something about um, taking what we've got and, and and making it better and using the opportunity of the last two and a half months uh, to be brave in terms of visitor attractions. So one of, one of the things that I've been saying continually is um, if, if, if you open the doors to the same people that you closed the doors to three months ago, that's not progress. Uh, and if they look identical to the people who came through the doors, that's not progress really. And if you're still doing the same things in the same way that you were doing three months ago, you've lost the opportunity that the last three months have provided for you. So really, I, I was just going to uh, echo some of the things that you've already heard, but also to really reassure you that um, the things that have been happening in Yorkshire have been happening right the way across the UK. So I'm just going to run through these uh, really quickly. So the first is, I think the most important, is that um, people are desperate to come back to you. And that's not just because they love you, though they do. Uh, it's also because, uh, and this is this is a bit saccharine, it's a bit poetic, but I stick by this. People in visitor attractions create the backdrop for people's happiest memories. So uh, whether you're a museum, a gallery, or a safari park, or a, an estate, or a castle, or a historic house, uh, you are the places where people go on first dates, and you're the places that people go and with their kids and meet up with their grandparents and you're the place where people get engaged and possibly married as well you are the you create the backdrops for people's happiest memories and therefore as Abby was saying it's absolutely no surprise that when people cross your threshold for the first time it's quite an emotional experience and we've seen that when the gardens opened like Castle Howard Estate but also Kew Gardens down here in London or Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire, actually one of the things that hit uh, front of house staff was just that emotional impact of people coming back to their favourite places and actually getting quite ch choked up about the fact that they were with their loved ones, they were with, with their friends, but they were back in a place that, that, that was enormously important to them. So I think that's the first thing. Don't underestimate the power of what you provide for the people who love you and will cross your threshold. And we also know from the visitor sentiment research that we've commissioned from Decision House that um, people absolutely want a, a safe environment. That's a kind of given. And I'll talk about that in a, in a second. And they absolutely do want to see social distancing and physical distancing being being policed and managed. And I'll talk about that in a second, too. 
But what they also quite like is for you to be patient and flexible and understanding of the fact and, and recognising the fact that they've gone through a tough time over the last three months. And for many of them, your visitor attraction, regardless of the kind of attraction it is, is their oasis in a coronavirus desert. It's a safe, familiar place that they have been thinking and dreaming of coming back to uh, and, and therefore it is really important to them. But if it's emotional for, for visitors coming back, it's also incredibly emotional for staff as well. Again, as, as Abby was saying, um, and again, one of the things that I've been talking about in webinars like this, but, but tweeting out is that there is a danger here, and Abby has expressed it very well, of creating two different cultures within your staff team. Those who've been working right the way through all of this and are probably exhausted, they're probably knackered. And then there's an, and, and also they're now bound up with the excitement and the adrenaline of opening and different jobs and flexibility and just that excitement of, of frenzy. Then there's a whole other group who have been furloughed, who have not been allowed to work or to participate. Uh, and, and if they're still furloughed now, are not allowed to participate in that opening up frenzy either and, and get all the excitement and the, the buzz and the adrenaline and all of, of all of that. So making sure that, that these two very distinct groups who've had very, very different experiences of furlough and, and COVID are, are still the same group of people with the same values and the same culture, but you're going to have to work really hard to make sure that this group over here doesn't feel that they're somehow second best or not wanted or not vital because they are. They just need to be introduced at different stages as your phased reopening happens. I suppose the, the next thing is that as we've been commissioning visitor sentiment research right the way across the UK uh, and the fourth wave is now being under, undertaken and we'll share that, we, we share that with absolutely everybody in the industry free of charge. Um, a number of things keep on coming back. Uh, and you've already, again, heard them this morning, but I think it's probably useful to be reassured by the fact that uh, this is the same for everybody. Um, one is that uh, they want to see physical distancing being policed and managed, actively policed and managed. So they want to see your front of house staff going up to people and saying you need to be two metres or from the 4th of July, one metre uh, apart. And they want that they want that reassurance that you're physically managing that, that you're policing it. And that's because, and this is a revelation, that's because members of the public have absolute faith that your front of house staff, your teams, will do the right, right thing, wear the right stuff, behave in the right way, use the right language, but they're far less confident that their fellow members of the public will. And again, you've seen examples of this over the course of the weekend and, and people's responses to really good weather. So being seen to be managing that physical distancing process is a, is a, is a really important one. I suppose the next, uh, and again, I'll echo uh, Abby here, is toilets. Um, and we know that if you work in visitor attractions, the most important things are toilets, uh, refreshments, weather. You know, it's that holy trinity of a good day out. Well, let me start with toilets because it's the one area that gives potential visitors the most anxiety. And in fact, when we did some sentiment research last week, 53% uh, of the public said that if toilets weren't open, they wouldn't visit. Now that's huge. So getting it right and, and getting it clean and safe and manageable is a really, really important indicator. But another one is that 21% of people said that if cafes and restaurants weren't open, they wouldn't go. I think that would change from the 4th of July. So I think that's that's going to be a fluid, flexible thing. And 50% of people said that if the experience wasn't as good as it is normally, they would think about not going too. And this comes back to, again, something that Abby was saying, um, and I've been talking about for some time, which is the most important thing here is to sanitize your site but don't sanitise the visitor experience. Uh, adhere to all the Public Health England guidance, make it clean, make it safe, make it healthy, make it risk free, but don't make it so anodyne that actually you remove the joy out of all of it. Because people have been stuck at home now for three months and actually they want to go out and enjoy themselves and they should, and they should be encouraged to do that. 
and we should be encouraging them to spend their leisure time and their leisure hour and their leisure pounds with us but they won't do that if it feels like a really saccharine rather anodyne sanitized experience so so make sure that you get that balance um, another thing that we also know, and again, talking to sister organisations in Europe that have already opened up, is that the kind of people who go to visitor attractions bring their best version of themselves when they visit. Uh, they tend to stick to the rules. They tend to be well behaved. They tend to do the right thing because that's the kind of people that they are. Uh, and that's the kind of environment that you've created. So um, although it's really important to make sure that your front of house staff manage and and police that physical distancing actually you'll tend to find that that they're not really needed to do that because most people are, are going to be behaving themselves already but it's a it's a change of atmosphere it's a change of style if you like from front of our staff and then a couple of things that that we've known from visitor attractions that have opened already here in the uk and one is the pre-booking so um, the pre-visit information is absolutely key. And as, as Abby was saying, um, they've seen that 99% of all visitors to Castle Howard have gone onto the website already. That's pretty typical of every visitor attraction in Alma membership. So people will be going onto your website. They'll be looking at your frequently asked questions. If you can do a video from the perspective of a visitor, from the moment they get out of their car to walking up the path, to going to the front of house uh, steps, to showing how they get their tickets scanned, uh, where the toilets are, are their cafes open, is the shop open? If you can record all of that from the perspective of a visitor, and it only needs doing it on an iPhone, it doesn't need to be slick. And in fact, the, the more slick, the less affected it is, oddly. Um, so if you can have kind of raw, slightly jumpy, more authentic thing, it feels valid. Um, that's huge, absolutely huge. And even if people don't watch it all the way through, again, they're telling us the very fact that you've thought about doing that and have posted it up on the website is incredibly reassuring. Um, so what do people want to go have a look at when they go onto your website before they visit? Um, can they book tickets? What are the time slots? Uh, what are the toilets like? Are you open? Is there catering? Um, uh, what's the pre-booking information that they need and can they bring their own food? Those are the typical ones that people are asking for. But the other really interesting phenomena is members. So if you have members of your organization, whether it's a museum or gallery or a garden, again, what's been happening is that members have been booking up loads and loads of slots at your visitor attraction, sometimes five in a week, but actually just turning up to one of those. And it's partly due to the fact that they are not used to booking or planning or organizing themselves to come to your visitor attraction. They take you for granted. Uh, they can just bowl up at any time, but this then is, is different. So uh, places like Kew Gardens, for example, in their first few days of opening, they saw each day something like 40 to 50% of no-shows. And that was from members who don't, they pay their once their membership fee, but then they don't pay again every day. But from non-members who are just buying a normal ticket, the no-show rate was about 5%. So real dichotomy between members not booking all the slots and not turning up and non-members booking their slots, paying their money and absolutely turning up. And the only reason that they don't turn up if they don't turn up at all is largely weather. So that's, again, the, the greatest significant factor. Um, and then lastly, the, the thing that I just like to, to pick up is, is sort of behavior, really. So customer behavior. Again, one of the things that we found both in, in Europe, where theme parks and museums and galleries have opened up, and also here in the UK, and particularly zoos and safari parks and gardens, but also from museums and galleries in places like New Zealand and Australia and, and the U United States of America, is that um, sales at retail stops have gone through the roof. So not only for many visitor attractions who've had online retail sales during lockdown, they've done very, very well. If they've been able to open, if they've been able to fulfill those, they've done really well. Um, but for those who've got shops open on their sites now, some of them are reporting their best record sales ever. 
So do think about fulfillment, do think about your stock, and, and really carefully do think about your wayfinding through um, your store uh, on site too. I suppose the, the, the last thing that um, uh, I'd just like to, to, to mention is that um, even when visitor attractions open on the 4th of July, and for some others it may be quite a long time yet, we're still not out of the woods. So for some visitor attractions, and particularly smaller ones, uh, they will find it very difficult, if not impossible, to open in an economically viable way if they have to still adhere to or manage or police two metre physical distancing or one metre physical distancing. It's just it, it, they just can't make any money. And that's absolutely the case for things like theatres and cinemas as well. So whilst the recovery is great and visitor attractions can open here in England from the 4th of January, uh, for the July rather, we're still not out of the woods. So our lobbying work uh, is, is continuing. So I'm still on five or six calls uh, every week with Treasury, Home Office, um, Cabinet Office, Number 10, DCMS ministers, uh, to make three key pleas. One is tourism was hit first, it was hit hardest and will take the longest to recover. And that's because of all the reasons that I've already mentioned in terms of physical distancing and not being able to open in an economically viable way. So furloughing and the job retention scheme needs to be continued for our sector way beyond that for the rest of the economy. And that may th be through to spring and Easter next year. Um, the second is that for financially vulnerable organisations, so typically those museums or galleries or cultural organisations who are not in receipt of regular government funding or any government funding whatsoever, they may not have the reserves or have eaten through their reserves over the last three months and therefore are a really um, precarious state. And, and what they need is, that, is grants rather than loans. They don't want to go into a new set of debt uh, in order to open up. So we're talking about an enlightened fiscal package from government to enable them to operate and to survive all of this. And then I suppose the, the, the last, uh, and this is an important one, is that tourism, as you know, particularly um, James knows, is, is the fifth biggest industry in the UK. It's the third largest employer. It's worth £157 billion to the economy and is particularly important in places like Yorkshire, where it has a disproportionate importance to local and regional economies. Um, and therefore, making sure that we can uh, support this industry so it can do all the magical things that we know that it can, from providing one in three of all new jobs, to being the place where um, it, it's, a, it's a very open level uh, sector where you can come in with absolutely no skills or soft skills or no qualifications right the way through to, you know, qualified out your eyes. Um, we're that sector um, and we are one of the top three employers in every constituency in the country. So we need that support and we need it from the British public. Uh, us Brits will be the saviours of the UK tourism industry this year. In a normal year, domestic tourism is probably worth about 80% to the UK tourism industry. This year, it would be worth about 97%. So us Brits will be the saviour of UK tourism sector this year, but so will the government. Uh, and that's why we're having continued conversations with government about the kind of level of support that this industry needs if we're to... Uh, survive and thrive and, and be the, the most important sector of the economy that we know that it is. So James, I'm going to uh, stop there um, because you've heard some really good details uh, already, but really happy to, to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Bernard. We do have some questions that we'll go through. Uh, we'll prob probably not give you all a chance to answer each one because it would be unfair to people that have contributed. But Bernard, thank you for your insight. That, that statistic of 80% moving to 97% is key. Um, and very much the welcome to Yorkshire message has been since day one, you know, invest to save. We get it. There's not there's not bottomless pits and any criticism, you know, online would be health service needs it, infrastructure needs it. We get all that. But a nine billion pound economy in Yorkshire alone, 225,000 jobs. And it, it's it's the support structure around that, the supply chain. And also, as you mentioned, and, and actually Cheryl and Abby mentioned it succinctly, it's that well-beingness. It's that feeling of 
um, coming alive again with your children, with your friends, with your partner, whoever it may be that you go and visit attractions to, it's 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 good for the soul. And without it, and we've we've got some colleagues speaking about the theatres within Yorkshire, whether it's Harrogate, Sheffield, Leeds Playhouse, even you know existentially thinking about closing down or not. You know, it it's, it really is something where you mentioned again, we've all got an opportunity to uh, play our part. And it's great that customer behaviour is suggesting that sales are going through the roof. Perhaps it's perhaps it's a, a cognitive leap that they're spending more. So I'm in trouble, aren't I, Cheryl, when I come with the kids and they'll be taking the cuddly toys on the way out. And I'm sure you'll make you'll use the social distancing arrows to make sure I've got to go through that shop twice, probably. Um, quick one in Bernard, if we may start with you, but Cheryl, I know you've been waiting a while. A, qu a question at the very top, actually, from Hazel at Whitby Museum. Uh, thanks for your question, Hazel. Museums have been asked to adopt the track and trace guidelines. If someone who has visited the museum later tests positive, and the question is, will, we may not know the answer, but Bernard, this would be your opinion. Will everyone who was in the museum at the same time have to self-isolate? Will this mean that the museum would have to close for 14 days if staff had to isolate? Have you uh, any insight on that or are you aware of, of, of what may happen if that was to happen? Do you want me to read the question again? No, 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 that's fine. Um, well, so much depends on the effectiveness of track and trace. Um, and so far, we know it's not had the best start. So uh, that's a cause for concern. Um, I suppose the, the, the second thing is that um, where you are able to deploy a staff team to uh, run your operation, whether it's a restaurant or a pub or a hotel or whatever, try and keep the same st staff team all the way through. So the same six people in, in one group, same six people in another shift, uh, and that's more easy to, to manage any kind of self-isolation that needs to happen. Um, in terms of track and trace and someone being found positive, it entirely depends on uh, when they came, how long ago, uh, at what stage they are in their in their illness. Um, but the best thing to do, and, and this will all change as well as a result of the two meter going down to one meter. So the best source of information that you can get is Public Health England. So do keep that on as one of your sort of favorite um, websites. Uh, and and don't don't just print off what they say at the moment because it changes on a daily basis. So keep on going back to Public Health England, uh, and that's the that's the most useful source for all of that kind of advice. Thank you, Bernard. And moving on to Cheryl, and I've just pinged you a question. So we have a question at the very top here. Oh, where is it? Uh, from Emily Dodgson at the Henry Muir Institute. I wondered how organisations, including the panel, are dealing with the track and trace requirements. So Cheryl, any experiences thus far with uh, track and trace? No, not not yet. Um, I think it's a good point that Bernard made. Actually, on all our risk assessments and everything else, we've got um, click through to the latest government advice rather than sort of detailing everything around. But no, we, we've had no no experience of it at all yet. And we are looking at the local R rate continually as well. And we're very pleased to see that it's dropped really low around us at the moment. So it's point three or something. Thank you, Cheryl. Abby, same question. And then I'm going to ask you a question from Andrew McGuinness from the Confederation of Passenger Transport. But firstly, track and trace, any incidents, any concerns, any experience thus far? No, not so far. And I think, uh, you know, I don't really have much to add to what the useful advice Bernard's give, given about, you know, we've again in our risk assessments, um, sort of stated that Public Health England link and, and the fact that it will be changing and updated regularly. So it's not a static document um, but no so far not uh, but within our own internal risk assessments you know we have procedures in place and we did have from the start so because we've been operating a farm shop for instance what um, our procedures would be for cleaning deep cleaning how long we'd close for that kind of thing okay so a question for yourself Abby and then back to Cheryl same question for both of you uh, thanks Andrew McGuinness from the Confederation of Passenger Transport for sending this in and I'll read this out to you the coaching group sector has a huge positive uh, benefit to regional leisure, tourism and education sectors, but there will be a short to medium term challenge uh, whereby attractions and the hospitality industry may not welcome groups, uh, you know, 40 or 50 people coming on a coach at any one time. The economy of the coach sector is very cha challenging, currently with a near 100% loss of cash flow since March and has not received sector specific support, nor in the main localised grant support. 
are there, are there collective common themes with other subsectors in the tourism sector where a collective ask for government support will be needed? I suppose that's for Bernard, if you want to come in on the back of that. But Abby, you know, a, a coach operator, when they're back up and running, wants to bring 50 people. How do you approach that? Yeah, well, we've actually we've got a school trip coming tomorrow. Um, so that, you know, that's the first kind of group visit we've welcomed back and we've worked very closely with that school about how they'll enter the grounds, how they'll pay for their tickets, how they'll book, what special rate we're doing. Um, so it's kind of a people heavy process at the moment. Um, we've mm. kept in touch and worked closely with the coach operators that come to Castle Howard regularly. Um, it's not a happy picture for them at the moment, as you're, the person asking the question has kind of alluded to. Yeah. Um, we know that there are a few series operators wanting to start advertising um, kind of Castle Howard as part of their product over the later part of the summer and into autumn. But they're talking about nine people on a coach and, you know, up to or half capacity at the very, very best. And we just don't know. I think the thing I just don't know, and it'd be interesting to see if there's any sentiment research around that, is is people's appetite to get on a bus at the moment and come for a day out. I think people feel much safer in their own cars, in their own bubbles. But as um, that kind of is relaxed and you can meet more than six people from, you know, at a time, um, whether whether the appetite is there and where it has a huge impact for us personally at Castle Howard is later on in the year. So the early part of our Christmas season during November is where we see huge amounts of coach tourism. And at the moment, you know, Christmas is is a really big, um, important earning time of the year for Castle Howard and it will be for many other attractions I know so um, we're already thinking about well yeah how could we do things differently and what could we design as a um, as a, a different product or a slight change to our normal product m and aim it at the audience that we know will be there and that will be confident to come out and and visit so at the moment with coach coach um, tourism specifically and and international I suppose as and when it, it comes back to us it's it's about having the capacity within our teams to deal with individual inquiries and I think um, you know one size certainly isn't going to fit all when it comes to tourism opening back up and travel opening back up um, so so yeah I think it's it's a it's a concern. That whole area is a is definitely a concern, and it's a big audience segment for Castle Howard, especially at times like Christmas. Um, so we'll want to be out there. We'll want to be in it to win it, it, you know, with the business and make sure we are open and able to welcome um, coaches and groups when they are ready to return. So I don't know if there's any wider sentiment research, Bernard, from that particular segment of of audiences. But as I said you know when I spoke we focused very much on the the circle of people closest to Castle Howard in our phase one of opening which is our members our locals our families um, and people who aren't coming you know from too far but we obviously want to be ready to welcome people from much further afield. Bernard do you want to answer that before I bring Cheryl back in? Uh, yeah, thanks. Just very briefly. Um, actually, I spoke um, at a webinar, webinar about 10 days ago for the Confederation of Passenger Transport. Um, and there are two areas of the visitor economy that I'm most concerned about. One is inbound tourism. So at the moment, um, because we've got a 14 day quarantine process that's been uh, instituted, 90%, uh, that's 9-0, 90% of all inbound visitors to the UK in any normal year come for less than two weeks. So a 14-day quarantine period means that we've lost 90% of the market for as long as that quarantine process is in, is in place. Uh, that's an absolute disaster. Uh, and so if you're highly reliant on overseas visitors, um, that's going to be really problematic for you and as long as that stays in place and therefore diversifying your marketing spend into the domestic and particularly very local market is going to be really, really important because you just won't get those overseas visitors coming back probably realistically this year. But the second area that I'm most concerned about is group transport. So um, those group bookings, those uh, packages, um, coaches, small minibuses, those kind of groups who do day visits, but also do package tours for four or five days. Um, they're going to be really, well, they already are really affected and have been from the outset because they're just not able to make money. 
uh, and also uh, for as long as social distancing measures are in place, they're also not able to uh, you know, operate in an economically viable way. So um, I've got actually I've got a meeting tomorrow morning with the Department for Transport to ask them specifically around this to see what additional guidance they could give to coach tour operators and others about how they can work sensibly and safely because everyone does sensibly and safely within the guidelines and, and a kind of time scale that they've got for the safe reopening of group travel business. So um, yeah, it's 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 really important to me and we're raising it continually with government. Thank you, Bernard. And Cheryl, I imagine uh, school groups, um, coach tours um, are a huge part of your business. Yes, um, I think our, our market is a bit different to the stately home market. Um, I used to work Woven Abbey, Woven Safari Park, and the Abbey used to get a lot of coach tours of, of generally older clients doing the tours, things like that. Um, and for the safari park and similarly for us the wildlife park the, the biggest one is actually the schools market we, we get less of the the coaches of um senior citizens to us but schools really important we had eighty eight thousand school children visitors last year and um the biggest concern is the cost of coach travel if you can't get as many on the coach or or wherever because that's always the biggest barrier to schools is that is the cost and generally the transport cost on top of of the entry so I think it's a watching brief. We're, we're not um, taking any bookings, uh, group bookings at the moment for the next or a few weeks. And it's something we're exploring at the moment. And our education team is back um, off furlough from the 1st of July. So we'll be investigating schools as well. Excellent news. So we're, we've got about five minutes left. So Cheryl, I'll stay with you and then go to Abby and finish with Bernard. Um, this, case, this is coming, I think it's anonymous, but it's a really fair question. Would you say the pre-booking process is allowing you to develop more uh, insights into who your customers are? So Cheryl, you mentioned the booking system had worked really well to some extent. Yes, yes. Apart from the the initial um, blip on the volumes of people trying to book, yep. it's been actually very good. And we've got a whole insights programme. So it allows us to get demographic profiling of people. We, we know more about them, where they're coming from, who they're coming with. and uh, I think it will give us some very, very valuable data this year. So it's one of the good things that's come out of it. <laughs> Cheryl, you're speaking to someone who has data for breakfast. I love it, honestly. Um, but uh, and Abby knows that. But Cheryl and Cheryl, if we can help you, if we can help any of our members or actually, you know, the whole industry to share insights. <clears throat> Eleven million viewers of Yorkshire.com over the year. Bernard, you may or not know this, but in between April and May, we saw an increase in 47% in visitor traffic. But the key statistic for me, which I was jumping up and down about, was 91% were first time visitors. So as you mentioned, you know, the, the great British public can and will help save the tourism industry. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and, you know, we're seeing a new audience coming to Yorkshire, which is really exciting because, you know, these are people that may have gone to Spain before or, or even other parts of the UK, but they're coming to Yorkshire. So if we can help you, Cheryl, with any insight as to who's coming, what they look like, what their buying habits are, how they're getting there. Are they coming with dogs? Are they coming in uh, uh, with with some accessibility issues? It's all really important. So, um, Abby, same to you. Customer insight. I know you'll be on top of this all over. Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that, I mean, Castle Howard before um, this period of time only had 20% of its bookings online pre-booking. Um, so to now have 100% is allowing us to do a lot more analysis um, and to, but but as I said as well, it's allowing us to ask questions in a post-visit questionnaire, which is giving us really good qualitative and quantitative research. I mean, the, the free comments box on our um, post-visit survey, we're just getting you know the most amazing detailed comments from i think this sign maybe would be placed half an inch to the left if i were you and you know like very you know very practical stuff but also very emotional stuff um you know somebody saying that they had covid and that they pictured in their head a day trip out to castle howard that's what they were aiming for that's what they based their you know motivation and recovery on and finally being able to walk through the doors and spend a day by the lake watching the dragonflies you know just to get that have that kind of um ability to communicate i think data is wonderful and it's great but we're still talking about human beings and i you know i think um it's just now for us managing 
what we do with that because we're still working on a limited capacity of, of teams and hours and who we've got available so um, we are managing within our team to communicate and um, dispel and you know aggregate quite a bit of that data but I know that Alva and, and Decision House and um, BDRC you know there are people out there for attractions who can who can help um, if you haven't got the capacity within your own organisation to kind of manage a post visit survey, but I would really say that we're seeing the value of it. James, you're muted. <laughs> Done it. I nearly got all the way through a full webinar without muting and also my Y badge keeps spinning around. Emma and uh, my colleagues keep saying, James, keep correcting it. So Bernard, the last 60 seconds for you, with all your experience in, 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 the, in the industry and, and the conversations that you're having at the moment, let's finish on a real positive. You know, what does success look like? I imagine keeping as many attractions going and sustainable for the future is success. But, you know, how can we all play a part, as we've all mentioned, to, to you know, build it back better, if that makes sense? Well, the, uh, I, I suppose the last thing that I'd encourage people to think about, and one is when you talk to your visitors, uh, you just need to remember three things. Uh, one is that they need to respect the rules and the guidance. They need to protect themselves and other people. But most of all, the most of all, they need to enjoy their day out. Um, and I suppose the most upbeat thing is that, uh, as I said right at the beginning, um, you create the backdrop for people's happiest memories and wow do they ever need those memories making now so there's a real responsibility on the mm. part of everybody in the visitor attractions industry to absolutely get this right um, and I suppose the the last thing would be uh, as, as Abby was saying earlier on I mean sanitize your site but don't sanitize the visitor experience I mean they're coming to you because they've been waiting to come they've been thinking about you they've been aspiring to come to you uh, and and you can fulfill that promise but on a political level we absolutely want every part of our visitor economy ecosystem protected and conserved so it can survive and thrive all of this because it's too important to let it go Thank you, Bernard. Sanitise your site, but do not sanitise the visitor experience. I think we'll be tweeting that very shortly. So um, thank you very much to Cheryl, to Abby and to Bernard. Thanks for all the contributions, both online, pre-webinar pre and post. Uh, you can click on the industry website link for all our future webinars and you can watch this back. Uh, so Cheryl, Abby, Bernard, thank you very much. Good luck and we'll speak to you all soon. See you later. <laughs>